Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second panel of the day. I'm here with Tim Wang. He is the recent author of the amazingly titled and actually from an artwork cover perspective, Subprime Attention Crisis, Advertising and the Time Bomb at the Heart of the Internet. So we're looking forward to a really great conversation about advertising technology. This day is day three reboot, tech in the future of news. So obviously pretty much every possible topic that we're gonna hit today is gonna be wrapped into this. But Tim, let's start with your seemingly contrarian but well-supported argument in the book, which is basically that digital advertising does not work. Let's just sort of elucidate and drop in there. Uh, sure, absolutely. So yeah, by way of introduction, um, hey everybody. So uh, my name is Tim Huang and um, yeah, the origin of this book uh, is is really uh, something that I take from the two years that I spent working at Google. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things that sort of happened in my experience uh, at the company was, you know, advertising makes up 80% plus uh, of the company's revenue. But it's interesting on a day-to-day -day basis that actually people don't talk about it at the company all that much. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion of self-driving cars and uh, artificial intelligence, but you know, the day-to-day -day of online advertising is is in fact kind of pretty obscure. Um, and so I got really interested in digging into this. Um, and in essence, the kind of core argument of subprime attention crisis is essentially that programmatic advertising, which is the kind of advertising that you see on the internet. Um, is is really the money men engine that's kind of powered the internet for the last 20 years, but simultaneously it may be actually much more fragile uh, than it looks. Um, and you know maybe just a few examples to get us started. I'm sure Marsha would want to dig into specific parts of this. You know, um, two things that kind of really inspired this book. So a few years ago, uh, Procter and Gamble, right, one of the biggest advertisers in the world, um, decided that they would run a small experiment where they cut something on the order of about 200 million dollars out of their online advertising budget. Um, and a year later, they kind of reported to the world that there was absolutely zero impact uh, on anything, on their bottom line. In fact, uh, with some of the efficiencies introduced by cutting the budget in this way, they actually expanded the reach of their advertising by about 10%, right? Which I think really begs, begs the question, like, what is this whole system that we've set up um, supposed to do, right? Um, so I think that's the first thing. Uh, a second thing that I think is really interesting is in addition to a lot of the evidence that, inter that online advertising might not be particularly effective, there's also a lot of evidence that the system is kind of rife with fraud in a lot of ways. Um, so a few years ago, um, there was a study that came out that suggested that almost about 60% of display advertising is fraudulent traffic. That is to say that the ad is delivered, um, but it's not delivered to someone real, right? It's a bot, uh, or it's delivered to someone on a click farm, right? They're being paid to basically click on ads. Um, which again, you think about other markets, we don't have a whole lot of examples of other globe spanning markets that have powered sort of the recent generation of technological development that are so flawed in this way. And so the book really makes the argument that what we're seeing may be really a market bubble uh, and that we should really worry about how sustainable uh, the sort of current, current internet economy really is. Yeah. So before we get into the sort of market bubble idea, I wanted to sure. start with obviously and probably disprovable anecdotes, which is that uh -huh. for my sort of COVID lockdown sort of browsing, it feels like digital mm -hmm. advertising works for me well at all, right? So my Instagram feed is just filled with like direct to consumer products that I've actually purchased a bit of, right? There's a sure. lot of, sort of yeah. online shopping that I do. So can you sort of explain to people then if we have this clear evidence that there is a lot of fraud, that there is sort of a lot of sort of the 200 million example of Procter & Gamble is a great one. How does that explain what our personal experience would seem to, experiences would seem to be online? Sure, absolutely. And I think this is a super important point, right? Because the claim of the book isn't necessarily that like advertising never works. Like clearly it does. Uh, and lots of people have examples where they're like, yeah, I saw something awesome on Instagram and I bought it. Right? It's my bonobo shirt. That's that. that that's exactly, that, right, right. That's, that's like a perfect yeah. example of that. Yeah, exactly. And I do think that that is that's a really important thing. But we have to distinguish anecdata data from the data about the market as a whole, right? And we have to say, even if we can come up with examples in which advertising works, does the system as a whole actually function? Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's not the case, right? One way of kind of flipping your sort of anecdote on its head, Marshall, is to basically say, okay. Well, there's that one incident where you can remember an ad working. Can you remember all the other ads that were delivered to you that didn't work, right? And then I think we start to look at the, the broader picture that we're facing here. Of course. So last, last, last question before we get to 2007 and that sort of sure. metaphor. Could you yeah. sort of quickly articulate 
the brief sort of transition in the web's history of advertising from sort of the 1990s up until basically sort of the programmatic advertising space today, because if we're looking at a broader picture of the history of the news industry and the various conflicts, especially with relate to sort of antitrust claims, you do see this history of a lot of this digital commerce becoming very contentious. So I think it'd be helpful for people to sort of see a sort of view of what did AOL look like? What were they doing in the late 90s versus what was Google doing and what are we sort of doing today with platforms like Facebook and Instagram? Yeah, definitely. So one of the fascinating things is you you say advertising, right? And I don't know about you, but my mind immediately goes to like Mad Men, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it's like kind of like offensive guys sitting in a room, like talking about like, you know, the copy on their ads, right? And it turns out that that is actually not the advertising that dominates most of the web now, right? And actually, in the early days of the in the 90s, when we were trying to figure out how we would monetize, right, these online platforms, um, this is a really big question, right? Because the traditional mode of selling ads was uh, just how you'd imagine buying an ad in a newspaper, right? Like you would call uh, wired.com, right? And you'd say, hey, I really want to put on an ad. Um, and they'd say, okay, cool. Send us the, the thing that you want to put on our website and then we'll put it on, right? Mm. But this is actually not, in fact, the way that most ads are bought and sold nowadays. So programmatic advertising refers to the specific configuration really that kind of Google pioneered. Uh, there's a couple other predecessor companies, but that Google really kind of figured out the model for and really won on. Um, and it really effectively relies on the use of kind of algorithms that buy and sell ads, right? So the minute you load a website that's gonna deliver an ad to you, um, there's basically a split, section, uh, a split second auction that takes place where sometimes tens, if not hundreds or thousands of advertisers will bid for your attention. And depending on who wins that auction, the ad will be sort of loaded and delivered, um, you know, at the point at which the, 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 the site is, is finally rendered to you. Um, and, and that really is kind of the core infrastructure of the internet um, and the core infrastructure of online ads. Now, the only interesting kind of nuance that I go into a little bit in the book is actually, in fact, that you, you might have think of, thought, think of this as like a very kind of like engineering Silicon Valley type invention. Mm -hmm. But actually, really core to this was a lot of people who really took as their model the stock market, right? Like the capital markets. And so in some ways, the kind of invention of these sort of attention marketplaces of the web are uh, in some ways not so, not so subtly modeled, I think, uh, on, on these kind of financial markets elsewhere. And there's a lot of resemblances between those two markets. That's the perfect pivot to the question of why then, and explaining why you're comparing the sort of situation with this bubble that you're referring to, why mm -hmm. do we sort of find ourselves in a similar situation to the financial markets in 2007? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things I got really interested in in the, in the writing of this book was to look into sort of our history and our understanding around financial bubbles, right? And it turns out that even though financial bubbles take lots of different forms, right? You have like the tulip craze, uh, you know, in Holland, right? You have uh, all sorts of the savings and loan crisis, right? We have generations and generations of financial crisis. There's a lot of dynamics that make financial crises similar. And there's a couple of key ingredients, right? Um, there's really three that I think are key. The first one is uh, really uh, bad or deteriorating asset values, right? So we're buying and selling in something that's becoming worth less mm -hmm. over time. The second one is opacity, right? You and I have to not be able to see what's really going on in the marketplace, right? Because if we did, then we could sort of bid the price down, right? And then the final one tends to be sort of what I'd call sort of pressures to create a bubble, right? So these often tend to be kind of perverse actors that have incentives to sell how great these assets are, even as the kind of value of that asset declines. And this is something that certainly happened in the 2007 subprime mortgage crisis, right? Which is a very wonky example, but I think a very apt one, mm -hmm. right? So you had these subprime mortgages that were declining in value, right? They were likely to default. You had opacity. It was really difficult to tell like what was in a collateralized debt obligation. And then you had these bubble mechanics, right? You had people who had very strong incentives to kind of keep this, this market rolling, even despite the fundamentals getting worse and worse. And I would argue that if you look at the online ad market, you actually see a lot of the same dynamics playing out, right? That you see subprime, what I still call subprime attention, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically that like people are not paying attention to ads. There's a lot of ad fraud, ad blocking is way up. There's also a lot of opacity. It's surprisingly difficult to get a sense of what the state of the ad market is. And then finally, there's a lot of kind of perverse incentives in the market to kind of keep this ball rolling, right? If you're a Facebook or a Google, you have to sell that digital advertising is better than everything else, right? 
Um, and you know, there's a study that the Guardian did, right, that suggested that some 70% of the money that ad buyers put into the programmatic ad system is actually consumed by the ad tech industry, right, even before it gets to a publisher on the other end. Mm -hmm. And I think that creates fantastically powerful incentives to kind of keep selling digital ads, even though the fundamentals may not be there. And so again, I kind of argue that like a lot of these ingredients kind of make me a little bit queasy, right? Because they resemble the financial bubbles that we've seen in the past. So here's something I don't understand given this metaphor, sure. which is a very useful one from a sort of mm. conceptual framework perspective. Sure. At least during the financial crisis, the period leading up to it, people who bought those terrible mortgages, they still got their home, right? So you, mm -hmm. you, they were getting a product that was sort of delivered. But to your sort of examples of product, Procter & Gamble, the fact that ad blocking is going up, the fact that it, is, sure. it isn't quite clear what the return is, all these sort of key examples, why are brands themselves so all in on this system? So I, you know what I mean? I, I get why there's the perverse incentive for Google and Facebook to sell every sort of ad, mm -hmm. you know, ad spend they can sort of get, but why are brands continuing forward into this sort of toxic process then? Sure. I think there's a couple of dynamics and I think it's a really complex question. I would say, let me dispose of the worst possible argument that I've heard so far, right? Mm. Which is basically that like, I've had a couple of angry ad tech bros message me uh, after the publish publication of this book. And they basically have argued, well, people put money into this and they wouldn't put money into it if it didn't work. So isn't that proof that it works, right? Which is, I feel like this crazy circular reasoning um, that I think is, is just kind of logically inconsistent, right? I think the reason that brands continue putting money uh, into the system is, is really for two major reasons. Uh, I think the first one is that I do think that one of the interesting things that we have is um, that basically other ad channels are actively deteriorating from a financial standpoint, mm -hmm. right? So I think Alberto was just talking about this, right? Like the state of newspapers is really in a difficult spot, right? Um, and because the fundamentals on those companies have not been as good and the circulation is declining, right? In some ways, the money has nowhere else to run. Right. Uh, even if you wanted to spend money, you would look like a total idiot, uh, you know, putting money into a newspaper, even though it might actually be as good as a digital ad. Right. So I do think that there's incredible pressures given how the media landscape itself is, is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think the second one is that the hype bubble is really real. Right. Like, I do think that, um, you know, if you're a middle manager at an ad agency, uh, you want to be seen to be working on the cool thing that everybody else is putting money into. Right. And no one ever got fired buying Google ads. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that that's also a really powerful dynamic, kind of continuing to force money into the system, uh, even despite sort of the fundamentals not being there. Yeah, that's really helpful. So let's speak to the news industry that you just sort of referenced. Right? Sure. So yeah. We're looking at the sort of basic storyline, which I do largely agree with, is that, you know, something that's really hampered the news industry over the past few decades on the internet is that much of the di much of the dollars that previously went to the industry are now going to sort of like digital tech giants. I know I don't sure. I don't blame Google or Facebook for that. I think at a certain level there's a product going on there. But what are the implications for the news industry given everything you've just sort of said? Because on one level, if you're sort of like a techno optimist, you would sort of say, well look, Facebook and Google are getting this money because they deliver a fundamentally better product, right? The story here makes sense. It makes sense to say, hey, like, why would I advertise? Let's say I was, I was launching a Catholic charter school in DC where I'm from. Why would I put that in the local newspaper when I could target young mothers who are, you know, of two to three year olds in DC? And Facebook enables me to do that. With Google, I could buy the keywords for Catholic DC charter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems if you're sort of telling the story I'm telling you, you would sort of assume that the situation we're in is sort of a technological inevitability given the nature of it. So you can just, can you just sort of engage with this sort of stream sure. of consciousness that I'm sort of trying to grapple <laughs> with as we're talking. Yeah, so I definitely, I think that there is something that you're articulating, which is I think is really key to this debate, right? Which is I do think that um, we have all collectively bought in to the myth of targeting, mm -hmm. right? Because on some level, it, yeah. right? Because it, it seems so intuitively obvious, right? Which is, oh, if you have all this data about people, how could you not be better at targeting a message to someone, right? But what's interesting is increasingly we're sort of seeing a lot of evidence that that might not actually be the case, right? So there's a great, uh, some great work by Alessandro Acquisti, who's a researcher at CMU, who's been doing a lot of work trying to compare like, okay, what happens if you target an ad with cookies versus an ad without cookies, right? And is the effectiveness really all that different, right? And it turns out that actually the evidence for that maybe is actually a little bit thinner than we think. Um, there's also other examples, right? I think one really fascinating one is that the, um, the UK privacy regulator, the ICO, 
just put out its postmortem on the Cambridge Analytica scandal, mm -hmm. right? And it actually pissed a bunch of people off because the report basically said, look, um, we can't find any evidence that all of this psychographic targeting actually had a big impact on the Brexit vote, mm -hmm. right? And so again, I do think that like we have sort of bought into this kind of intuitive argument that data makes ads more effective. Um, but the evidence to actually prove that is really, really difficult to determine. Um, you know, I talked to some researchers who, you know, they, they are, take the other side of this argument, right? They say, um, <laughs> they say, they say, they say ads definitely work, but the subtlety they put in, which I can, I, I'm okay with, right? The subtlety they put in is based on our studies, the effect is so small that you have to run such large experiments to determine whether or not ads actually work that in practice, it's too expensive to know whether or not ads work. Right. And so I do think that like, we need to push against that, right? We need to push against this myth that digital advertising is in fact so much better. And in fact, in many cases, it may just be as bad as all the advertising we've always had. Yeah. Because in the book, you sort of give the example, um, I'm not going to, I, I forget, you, you know what I'm referencing, just sort of, mm. I, I know that half of my advertising spend is wasted. I just know which, I don't know which side of it is like that, that time it's always sort of going to be true. That's right. Exactly. And that may just be like a kind of persistent sort of issue. And, and I do think, you know, so one of the questions you may be leading up to is, okay, okay, Tim, there's this bubble. How do you pop it? Right? Like, is it going to pop? What will cause it to pop? Right? And I do think that one of the interesting things is we're about to see a globe spanning natural experiment, which is as these privacy laws come into place, right? CCPA in California and the successor law that just passed, as well as kind of the rollout of things like GDPR. Uh, we will actually see, like, if you advertise without all of this behavioral targeting, is it that much different, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if it becomes clear that the emperor has no clothes, that's a pretty powerful dynamic uh, that might potentially impact uh, the, the sort of popping of the bubble. Are we sort of seeing previews of the bubble popping and we look at how a lot of digital publishers the past two or three years have really run into serious sort of advertising revenue troubles? Sure. Yeah. I mean, again, one of the skeptical things that I hear from some people is like, okay, so why should I care, Tim? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, are you just talking about Mark Zuckerberg having a less, like a billion less dollars, right? He's not even going to feel it, right? That's like how much he has under his couch. And so like, but the answer is no, right? Because you forget that the programmatic advertising ecosystem is not just about the big platforms, right? It is the ecosystem that is funding a lot, many smaller media companies right now. And I think if you want to know what a sustained downturn in the programmatic ad markets would look like, you just have to look around in the sort of ad markets of the 2020s, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically that, that the kind of ecosystem we've set up has created such an impoverished situation that it turns out that even big companies like, I don't know, like Vice, right? Can't even survive like a month or two of downturn. So what that suggests to me is that if it's really a structural problem, right, the human cost of this could really be quite significant. And it impacts people more than just kind of engineers making a quarter mil, you know, in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Vice because it sort of brings to mind just sort of a more meta conversation. Basically what the real topic of this conversation is, how much mm -hmm. do we know about anybody, which is sort of what the key is sort of advertising. Sure. Is, which if you look at Vice's yeah. story that they were sort of telling sort of during venture story time, it was, hey, we understand Gen X and millennial people. We could market to them better. We have our agency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't prove to be true given the nature of their business model. Companies will sure. valued. That's where that sort of ends. Is it really possible in the internet era to really know anything. That's what I'm just sort of wondering, <laughs> right? You know, if, if we sort of, at a key sort of level of we're engaged with these narratives, like, do we do we actually ever, can we know anything? Are we basically just sort of Don Draper with like a better sort of like tech setup? Like, well, how do you sort of think about this? Uh, the, oh, and polling, would... and polling too. We had the polling disaster during the election. Right, I, this right, has been a strong, yeah. you know, period for empiricism. <laughs> I agree, yeah. I mean, I do think that like, um you know, particularly in the ad space, right? I would be more comfortable in a world where uh, sort of digital advertisers are like, yep, it's garbage, but you know what? It's just as garbage as everything else, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. like, that's kind of a world I could live in if we were sort of like honest about like the kind of state of these technologies. I think actually the fact that there has been this big hype cycle around digital advertising has created a bunch of distortions in the marketplace, right? Um, and, and again, I, to go back to the researcher I was just talking about, like, I do think it's possible to know things. I think the irony is just that, like, it may be too expensive and more than we care to do the work on to actually know things, right? And so that requires us either, now, now we're getting into the realm of sociology, right? Which is like, as a society, are we going to put in the work to actually figure some of these things out? Or are we just comfortable with, like, circulating the same garbage that we've always circulated?
Yeah. So sort of in the, in the wired review of your book, uh, it sort of opens with the conventional wisdom is that tech companies, tech platforms, et cetera, have all this data insert surveillance, capitalism reference, all those sort of dynamics. To what degree do you think the conversation about data and people, how much is that skewed by the research that you're sort of like looking into sort of, is this like, how much, how does that impact the way we sort of tell that narrative in our heads? Totally. Yeah. So I think the book ends up being actually interestingly sort of a, a, a two double-edged blade, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, like the idea, the hope of the book is to annoy as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it annoys people who are uh, sort of what I would call sort of ad tech hawks, right? Who are basically like, no, we really can predict people and we really can deliver you a message that is just sublime and you will just do whatever we want to, right? That effectively Facebook has a mind control, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, what's interesting is that that's a narrative that's both adopted by the sort of tech optimists, but it's also a narrative that's adopted by the tech pessimists, right? And I think there's a very real critique, which is that people who are tech critics uh, often tend to just like adopt the claims of industry and if anything, amplify the claims of industry because they're willing to say things like, yeah, you know, we need to regulate Facebook because Mark Zuckerberg has a mind control, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I do think that we need to come up with an account to critique these companies that doesn't rely on their own marketing claims. Uh, and I think this is very much the case in what you're talking about, right? Which is that essentially, like, if we have built this huge surveillance infrastructure, the reason we should object to it is more than simply that, like, it gives companies behavioral control over our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Because the evidence for that is extremely thin. We should base it around, I don't know, like, the dangers of aggregating large amounts of data like this. Um, and I think that's a much more robust way to kind of build these types of critiques. Um, so I, I really am in favor of kind of like getting away from some of the more, um, you know, I guess like breathless claims, even on the kind of critical side of this debate. So angry ad tech bros aside, what's sort of been the sort of broad ecosystem response to your sort of thought? Have you had any sort of interesting pushback, interesting dynamics you didn't really sort of take into account? How's, how have you sort of been thinking about that? Yeah, definitely. So I'm, I'm getting all sorts of fascinating stories. Uh, and I think I'm also getting policy interest, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the fascinating stories are like, increasingly, there's people who have gotten in touch kind of like privately on back channel, being like, Oh, yeah, I was at I was at a unnamed large tech company from this year to this year. And like, we ran a study internally, right? And like, when it got to a certain point, we were kind of told that we shouldn't look into this anymore, right? Or like, I used to work at a marketing agency, and mostly my job was cooking the books, so our campaigns could always look effective. And so um, there's a project I'm working on now called AdLeaker, which is basically a secure signal line where whistleblowers can drop information to me. Because I do think that there's a lot of incredible stories that are just kind of leaking below the surface that I think like, are lurking below the surface, yeah, Freudian slip, <laughs> that I think should, should find their way out to the, the world, right? I think the second one is increasingly, right, like, um, you know, if we, if we make it past January, right, there's a big question about everybody wanting to do something about the tech companies. But I think in DC, there's like still a very deep kind of vacuum mm -hmm. as to what that thing is. And, um, you know, thankfully, I'm starting to hear from people who are like, oh yeah, could these things be built out into a kind of policy proposal Right, that we could actually pursue in a real way. And so I'm, I'm also excited to see that as well, because I think there's, there's probably going to be a battle royale that gets figured out as various policy proposals debate to be like the thing that we should apply to these big tech companies. Um, and so I think it's a good opportunity for us to reconsider, you know, ads, which are so kind of critical and, and central to all this. Of course. So I think part of that reconsideration, because I think a central sort of feature of this conversation is the role that narratives sort of play in this. What is sort of your narrative for a better version of the web that isn't sort of based upon this bubble and is and, mm -hmm. it's, and it's sort of at a, at, at a more practical level isn't based upon fraud, I guess, if you're buying, if people are buying <laughs> your argument. <laughs> yeah, could we just not base our house on a stack of lies, you yeah. know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I, I'm not an ad hoc, right? Where it's basically, there's some people that you talk to who are like, I just don't think there should be ads on the internet, right? And yeah. I don't think that's like, I just don't think that's realistic. And I think it overlooks a lot of the social gains that you get from things like ads, right? Like uh, we have to admit that there are services that are a lot more accessible than they would otherwise be because they run an ad ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the real debate is, do we believe in an internet that's largely based on a monoculture business model of ads? Like, do we want the largest companies that influence our experience of the internet to be based on this single business model, right? Mm 
Um, and, you know, my answer humbly that I would submit is no. Like, I would love to see an internet that has a more diverse set of business models. And I think in many cases, the dominance of ads has actually sort of smothered out other experiments in the space. So, you know, one of the things I hope for is just like, could we build a kind of more um, robust internet that's based on many ways of making money, not just this one huge system that we've created? Oh, yeah. So what are some of those experiments? Yeah, definitely. So I, again, I'm, I'm not going to blow your mind, right? Like I'm definitely not one of those people, which is like, <laughs> In five it's all going to be, my mind. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, it's, it's all going to be about micro payments on the blockchain. Like it, that's, that's garbage, right? Like that's not going to scale in the way that we need it to be. Right. But I, I think like, right. I, I think things like subscriptions, right? Like mm. I think it's useful. I think this, those types of models should scale. Right. Um, and, and I do think that like that, that is something that should be pursued. I also think there's a lot to be done, I think, in terms of not just the business model of the company, mm -hmm. but also how the company itself is governed. Right. So I'm really excited, right. In this like kind of COVID era where people are unfortunately kind of forced to experiment with new things, right. That we're seeing things like co-ops, right. Like we're seeing like defector type models come out. Uh, and I think that sort of stuff is exciting and, and really interesting to me. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the sort of ad based or subscription part, because when people are sort mm -hmm. of ad hocs, to use your language, I think they forget the fact that they could critique the ads themselves and that sort of system, but that system is a subsidy. So for example, that subsidy means people get free information. Yeah, uh, which in many ways can be clickbaiting can be sort of bad, but at a key sort of level, a world where everyone has to pay to subscribe to a news source isn't necessarily a good one, especially given the fact that there tend to be bigger players, um, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street totally. Journal, who yeah. could get that more. So how do we think about, how do you just think about that sort of conundrum when it comes to sort of different models? Yeah, so maybe two thoughts here that might be useful. Um, I do think that in some ways, this is the great sort of ethical conundrum, right, of the internet. And I do think that like the battle between ads and subscriptions is kind of where it's at, right? Like either you have other people pay for it or mm -hmm. you pay for it, right? Um, and, and yeah, and I do think that like the question of equity is a really big one, right? Um, and so the way I kind of frame up this issue is that in some ways ads have allowed us to kick the can down the road for way too long on the internet, right? Because we really haven't had to wrestle with the question of access because it's all free to the mm -hmm. consumer, right? And I kind of wish it, that we had a world that was more based on subscriptions because we would suddenly have to confront the very tricky question of, okay, do we want to subsidize access to some of these services? Like as a public good, do we want to mandate that some of these services should be offered for free, right? Like I do think that like kind of come to Jesus moment is something that we may actually need um, because right suddenly we have to confront the hard question of like, okay, uh, is, is a search engine as important as having electricity to your home, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and okay, if you're okay with that, right? Like is social media so critical that it's like electricity to your home, right? And like, if we're okay with that, like how about like, a new social media company like TikTok, like is that is that begin you know? And so I do think that like um, it's allowed us to kind of push off some of these questions. But I do think that we should be confronting those questions sooner rather than later, even if ads remain robust. Um, just because I think like it's it's relevant for so many other challenges and discussions that we're having on the internet. Yeah, just sort of the last bit here. I like your framing of the conundrum around equity and kicking the can down the road because that brings it back to the subprime mortgage crisis issue, mm -hmm. which is that, hey, home ownership is largely a good thing from a sociological perspective. I think the idea of an ownership society, the idea of expanding access, especially mm -hmm. given like longer histories, is a largely good one. It's when that is then bundled into terrible toxic aspect and those things. And then the economy blows up, you get sort of a problem. So I think you sort of nicely tied that together well with how the right. conversation sort of went there too. And I think it's like a little bit like, uh, I always joke, it's like that scene in Indiana Jones where you got to like swap out the idol for something else, right? Yeah. Because like the, the problem is the ad ecosystem is like has been so good at making so much money in such a short period of time. It's very hard to think about what is like weighs the equal amount that we can kind of easily switch in. Right. And again, now it just becomes a question of trade off and values. Right. Like, are you OK with a smaller Internet? Right. That grows less slowly in order to preserve certain types of values. But again, I like I think like we should we should be having that debate. Right. Because I think yeah. that's really where the meat of this is. That's really helpful. So, Tim, um, where can people find you? Obviously, they should find your book. But, you know, any last details <laughs> you want to add? Uh, sure. I, I, I'm posting all sorts of garbage on Twitter all the time. So if you like, you like stuff I've said, I'm at Tim Huang, T I M H W A N G, uh, on Twitter. And, uh, and also you can find me on my website, uh, if you want to get in touch over email. Great. Well, so Tim, thank you so much for enjoying the conversation. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Marshall. Take care.